Okay. We've been going through some lessons the last couple months, some basic lessons of Bible study and the Gospel. And in that vein, it's time for us to do a chart lesson. And it's going to be a little different chart lesson this morning than usual. But I thought we'd go through the book of Acts, just to simply explain, or a basic lesson about the book of Acts, where its place is, what's its import uh, for us in relation to God's will, which was our study last week. Recall last week we talked about the will of God concerning you, which is clearly stated in the Scripture, in Paul's epistles primarily for you, where you have God's will that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. In everything give thanks. Uh, your sanctification, to, avo to abstain from fornication. Uh, these are parts of God's will, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. And so, talking about God's will, we realize that this is the subject of what we call dispensational Bible study. Dispensational Bible study is not a term or a chapter in your Bible, though the word dispensation appears in your Bible. But when we talk about dispensational Bible study, we're focusing on the revealed will of God. And uh, the implication of that is that God's will changes, that there's a progressive revelation to the Word of God. It wasn't dumped out of the sky all at once. God revealed His Word and compiled His Word over time. And so, as a, a consequence of that, His will, His instructions have changed throughout the Scripture. And so, to say the statement, though maybe well intended, that I do everything in the Bible, well, you can't and you shouldn't because not everything is to you and there are some instructions that contradict others because they're for different people at different times in different situations. And this is pretty commonsensical and yet when it comes down to some very important issues, especially concerning the change in God's will between Jesus' earthly ministry and Jesus' ministry from heaven through the body of Christ, people tend to neglect this idea. And they tend to think, well, everything in the New Testament is mine or everything from from uh, you know, David on his mind, so we love the Psalms and Proverbs, and this is just incorrect. And so, when we draw dispensational charts in these lessons, the idea is to, to, to have fresh in our mind a reminder of the changing will of God, or the changing dispensational perspective in the Bible. And so, very simply, very generically, we can draw a chart and talk about the promises that God made to Abraham. Even going back as far as Adam, he gave a promise there after their fall that he would send a seed of the woman to save them. And so there's this operation of God where he's based on promises back here. And this changed when God started operating through the law given to Moses. There was no law that Abram had to follow to receive the promise God gave him, which was that he would be a nation and he would have a son and a seed and his nation would be a blessing to the other nations. He didn't have to do anything. It was just, okay, I believe it. Right? And then God adds the law given through Moses on Mount Sinai where there was a nation of people called Israel and they operate according to that law. At least they should have. Right? And so for many, many years there's this law operation of God. In fact, Jesus, we'll draw the cross in here, was made of a woman born under the law. Right? And so his life and his death was under the operation of God according to the law. In Matthew 23, Jesus says, As those who sit in Moses' seat tell you, that's what you should do. Now here it says, don't be hypocrites like they are. But what they're reading from Moses, that's what you should do. So Jesus communicates in Matthew 23 that the law is still what God intends for Israel to do, for his operation in the world. He came, in fact, he says, to fulfill the law and the prophets. Right? And so you have this law operation of God. We read also, as we've studied in the epistles of Paul, this dispensation of grace. This operation of God that is separate and distinct from his law operation to Israel. Okay? And it's a change, once again, in God operating in this world, not considering the sins of people a hindrance to his relating to them. And so, not imputing their trespasses unto them, is how Paul speaks in 2 Corinthians 5, but this idea that Christ did some work now being communicated as the finished work to save people from their sins. And so, how does God operate today in this world, this fallen, evil, sin-cursed world? Well, He's commending His love toward us. We don't deserve that. You're right. That's what grace is. And so, the way God operates today is according to His grace. And we ask, well, why isn't God judging the world today? Because this is the way He's operating. There's judgment under the law, right? If there's promises of a nation being over other nations, there has to be some sort of judgment in the future. Yeah. But that's not what's going on today. We also read in the Bible a time called the kingdom, or a time of Israel's promised kingdom, going all the way back to Abraham, right? And this kingdom is what's spoken about by Peter and what's spoken about by 
the book of Revelation. The, the Apostle John writes that one. And so we have this kingdom operation of God, where at the kingdom in that time, salvation has come to the earth, and Christ is reigning on the earth as king. Now, when Christ came, he came and said, yeah, I'm the king, but he didn't sit on that throne reigning over the earth at the time. But they spoke about a coming kingdom. And so just very generically, we have this chart of God's changing operations, of the changing will of God. And so we can get into more details regarding this, how in the Garden of Eden back here, God gave them what they needed in, in, in the garden and told them not to eat of the tree. There is no tree God told you not to eat from. That was for Adam, right? After the fall entered, God had to add sacrifices to what they did. They didn't sacrifice anything in the garden. But remember when sin entered? Suddenly there's sacrifices. Remember Cain and Abel? There's instructions there where Abel's offering sacrifices, Cain's offering the wrong sacrifice. And so there's sacrifices added to that. Well, that wasn't his instructions in the garden. But if you're stuck in the garden operation, you don't know about that, right? Noah was offering sacrifices to the Lord after it flooded the earth, after the flood on the earth, right? He was offering a, an altar to God. And so you have that. These promises, even Abraham's own life, when God promised to him unconditionally that he'd be the father of a nation over the other nations, he later added to that circumcision. Remember? So depending on where you're at in Abraham's life, there could be required circumcision or not required circumcision. Right? So there's things God instructed that were different, that changed. So it's not true you can do everything the Bible says, because you're not in the Garden of Eden. You're not before the flood. Uh, you're not before circumcision, right? And you're not circumcision to begin with. So just, you can't do these things. Right. Well, see, what's the important part for us to understand then, to know how God's will has been revealed? The reason why it's important to know the entire scripture like this is to know that everything God has revealed about himself and his operation communicates something about him, about Jesus Christ, and about the mystery of his will, which is ultimately revealed through the Apostle Paul. We covered this last week. In the Law of Moses, there's a variance there in, in, in the, the, the will of God and the instructions from God. At a time at the very beginning when they got the Law of Mount Sinai, they didn't even have a land. So there were many laws in the law that they could not perform because they weren't in the land yet. Right? They were in transition. Right? When they got to the land, they started implementing them. Okay? Others they performed before. Daily bread, for example. God gave them that in the wilderness. He stopped giving them that when they were in the land. See, so God changed the way he operated, even under the law. There was a time where Israel had no kings. It was just judges God had set up according to the law, and the judges would answer to God's word, but would judge the tribes. Then there was a time where a king was set up. And Samuel anointed King Saul and under God's admonition, and then King David and King Solomon, right? So they're kings. Well, based on where you're at in Israel's history under the law, are there kings or are there no kings? Well, things changed. You know, were these kings disobedient to God? Or was, did God anoint them to be there? Well, God chose those kings, Saul, David, and Solomon, right? But he didn't choose kings before them. So anyone who claimed to be one was doing it incorrectly. You see, so things have changed under the law program. You have those kings that split a nation. Solomon split the nation as a result of his disobedience. And so after a certain time in Israel's history under the law, you had the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The nation was split. So if you don't know where you're at in the law program, you're reading house of Israel, house of Judah, thinking that they're exactly the same thing, and they're not. They're all the 12 tribes together, but there was a time of their split. Right? So these are things that change under the law, how God operated what was consistent through that was that God gave his law and they should obey it. That was consistent. That's how God operated. Right? That's where you found forgiveness. The priesthood was established. And that's how you accessed God. The prophets was how God spoke to you. Right? Jesus came fulfilling law and prophets. So you have that. And so you have the kingdom operation where to enter this kingdom you have Jesus come preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Given the Holy Spirit to the twelve apostles saying you're going to enter this kingdom. They're hoping to get here. It didn't happen. What intervened? The dispensation of grace. Right? So we have this as what's called a... Oh, out of ink there. We have this, what we call as the mystery dispensation, the dispensation of grace that was not prophesied before, that was not known before, that interrupted Jesus' disciples transitioning into the kingdom operation that this is what's prevented Christ from returning, right? Else he would have been back already. There's something happening now that is preceding the kingdom, okay? These people were expecting to go through that tribulation, that wilderness wandering, to enter that, that dispensation of the kingdom there. 
very general, very simple dispensational chart that articulates God's changing operation and His changing will at the time. Right? There's times where God, though He desires men to be saved, He's giving judgment. So on that day, He's not saving people. Right? There's judgment here. There's judgment throughout the law. We read about in Isaiah about how God judged the city of Jerusalem. And how the judgment day came to Jerusalem and Babylonians came and took them away. Right? He wasn't trying to save Israel on that day. You see. So, what's happening to Israel? Where is salvation found? What is God doing? This is a dispensational question. What is the will of God? You have to understand how God's will has changed through the Scripture to understand how to use your Bible. When you open it up and you find yourself somewhere, you have this in your mind saying, well, where, where are we at? Right? What is God doing? Of course, you can read the context, but it's a big book. You know, so, but this gives you a general idea in your mind to know where you're at. Now, today I want to talk about the book of Acts. There's your dispensational chart. Now I want to talk about the book of Acts. Because Acts is a book concerning this section right here. You see that? That's the book of Acts. It's between dispensation. It's like a transition here. Right? What's going on in the book of Acts? And Acts is a, a, a very common book for people to make mistakes in. It's a book that has caused confusion for people because they're trying to find the will of God and it seems in the book of Acts it's hard to nail down sometimes. Especially those who are new to right division. who start to hear that Paul had a different message than Peter and grace was different than under the law. And that's different than what about the book of Acts? That seems like a muddled mess, right? And there's an allure, however, as we talk about being mid-Acts, Pauline dispensational, there's an allure for people who are new to right division to go back to the book of the Acts, to restudy it, to see what they missed. Right? And they want to see what, what was there they didn't know before. And that's not a bad thing. But because of the multitude of confusions that exist about it, um, there's, people tend to forget the simplicity of what happens there. And that's what I want to communicate today. A simple explanation of the book of Acts, a basic explanation of the book of Acts, through some charts. Okay? Acts is going to be a chronicle, a history, it's a history book, a chronicle of the change in what God was doing. He was doing something dispensationally. It changed. Acts is the chronicle of that. It's the history of it. And so it's dispensationally significant. Without the book of Acts, we don't have a history of the change. right? Uh, but also it means since there's change, don't anchor yourself there. Don't take yourself and say, you know what? I'm going to find my pattern and purpose in the book of Acts, and I'm going to sit down there and not go any further. You need to keep reading, right? And so this is the idea. And with that thought in mind, we'll just articulate here what has happened before and what happens after the book of Acts. We have the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? We know that it would be good news. At the end of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the disciples didn't know what was going on. Why is he dying? Now that he's dead, now what? Oh, he's risen? We don't believe you. He appears to them? I guess that's true. It, there's a lot of confusion going on here, but this is the last thing that occurred in Matthew, Luke, and John. He rises from the dead. He communicates what Christians call commissions, or the great commissions to his disciples. In Matthew 28, he talks about going to all nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teaching them all the commandments that he gave them. In Mark 16, he tells them to go and teach the gospel, that if they believe and are baptized, they shall be saved, and these signs will follow them that believe. In Luke 24, Jesus tells them that you should go to Jerusalem, and that remission of sins in my name shall be preached in all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So go there until you're endued with power from on high. Right? John says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And I'm giving you the power to forgive sins. And I'll breathe upon you the Holy Ghost. You don't hear about John's very much. Confusing. Right? But you have the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, it talks about going to Jerusalem. And then when you're endued with the power from Jerusalem... Go to Judea and Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the world. So you have these testimonies, these commissions given to the disciples from Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And this is where we begin. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, the other side of the book of Acts, over here, what's the next book following Acts? Romans. We've done a chart through Romans. We've explained Paul's foundation the book of Romans, the foundation of the gospel for the church, the body of Christ. And so we'll just draw... Here, uh, as an example, the church, okay, which is not a building, it's a people, right? but it's the church, the body of Christ, as articulated in the book of Romans. Now, how do we get from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John 
Israel's Messiah coming to minister to the circumcision, raising from the dead, right, telling them to go preach the kingdom, to Romans, a Gentile country, saying, Israel what? Where's the kingdom? Doesn't matter. You trust Christ's finished work and you get saved by God's grace. How do we get from here to here? And that's the book of Acts. Right? That, so we're starting simple here because we need to always have that in our mind. When whatever detailed verse, whatever confusion you have in the book, understand the purpose of this thing. It's to bridge what happened here, what God was doing here in Matthew and John to what God is doing here right? in, Paul's, in Paul's ministry. What God was doing here, what God's doing here. That's the book of Acts. It's a bridge there. Okay? And so the first chart I want to draw here is the book of Acts being what they call the book between. It's another name for the book of Acts. It's a book between. The book between these two things. About the book of Acts, you're confused how that happened. Like, how does Jesus say, go to Jerusalem, begin at Jerusalem, teach them the commandments, water baptized, to here. There's no mention of water baptism. You're not going to Israel. He's going to Rome. How'd that happen? Right? Without a kingdom, even. Okay, that's interesting. You see, it's a book between two things here. There's two Gospels. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, there's more than two Gospels in your Bible. But between these two things, there's the Gospel of the kingdom. That's what Jesus came and preached in Mark 1.14. That's what the disciples went and preached throughout the ministry of Jesus. The gospel of the kingdom. But the gospel of the kingdom does not include the cross, which is why when Jesus brought it up, they didn't know what he was talking about, even though they were preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom was what was promised to Abraham, that your seed would be a nation above the nations, and through you all the nations will be blessed. And through the law it was further revealed that there would be a king through the line of David, through God's covenant, that would sit on the throne of Israel, that would be a, a blessing to the world. Christ comes as that king, then he leaves. But that's not a shock because Jesus explained that I'm going to leave and come back. That's what Jesus said in his earthly ministry. I'm going to leave and come back. So he leaves, and the hope is he comes back. That's the gospel of the kingdom, that the kingdom is at hand, that Christ is going to return, and finally righteousness and justice will reign on the earth. Kingdom, right? Good time on the earth. That's what they're hoping for. That didn't happen, you see. How do we go from the gospel of the kingdom to the gospel of the grace of God that's communicated in the book of Romans. Paul calls it the gospel of Christ in Romans 1 verse 16. He says, look at Romans 1 real quick. <clears throat> he says he can't wait to communicate to those that are in Rome. Romans 1 verse 14. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome. Why are you preaching the gospel of the kingdom to Rome? I think there may be a reason why the Roman Catholic Church has historically thought that they are bringing in the kingdom of God. Maybe because they miss what the book of Acts is communicating, this change. And they see the kingdom gospel taught here. They see Paul going to Rome with the gospel. So you see, I mean, that surely has had no effect on history. No, I think it has. Right? Acts is what explains that change and transition. A gospel has changed. You see, something has changed to get to here. It hasn't been the same. You read the book of Romans, you read the doctrine in there, it's different than what you read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There are two cities, for example, Luke 24. Look at Luke 24. I mentioned this briefly a moment ago. When Jesus tells his disciples, after his resurrection, what to do in Luke, he says, These are the words which I spake unto you in verse 44. While I was yet with you. After Christ's resurrection, he says, while I was with you, his earthly ministry, this is what I spoke to you. Is he changing anything? No. He's teaching the same thing he was before the cross. Right? He says, this is what I was saying to you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Jesus says after his resurrection, I'm speaking to you now, and now you may know a little bit more how what I came to do is fulfill what the law and the prophets said. He's speaking what the prophets had spoken since the world began. Okay, Verse 45, And he opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. So they get some understanding, but it was right there in the Scriptures. So he opens their eyes to it. And he says in verse 46, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Why does Jerusalem matter? That just happened to be where they were at. No, 
Peter wasn't from Jerusalem. Okay? Jerusalem was the covenanted city. As we're studying in Isaiah now for some 50 some weeks, Zion has an important part in God's purpose in prophecy. Amen. He has a covenant with them. He says he's married to it. He says he has obligations to it. And so what he says here, now that these things are being fulfilled, begin at Jerusalem with preaching for forgiveness in my name. The implication there is if Jerusalem is not forgiven, we can't proceed with the fulfillment of God's covenant in the gospel. Right? Begin at Jerusalem. What if they don't want it? Begin at Jerusalem. Right? That's the instruction. You can't have a fulfilled kingdom come to Zion unless Zion is on board. Right? Luke 24, that's missed by many people. Luke 24, verse 48. Ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. This, of course, is the Holy Ghost being poured out. Right? And so you have Jerusalem on one side of the image. And on the other side, you have, well, let's look at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Luke wrote the book of Acts. You should know that. <laughs> I hope that that's old news to you. Luke wrote the book of Acts. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke. He also wrote the book of Acts to the same person for the same purpose. You can read about that purpose in Luke chapter 1. But Acts 1.1 1, 1 says, The former treatise have I made, uh, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. That's the Gospel of Luke. Until the day in which he was taken up. Now that wasn't included in Luke, but it's going to be here in Acts. After that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandment unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Which apostles had he chosen? There were 12. Well, there were 11 at this point, as one had betrayed and committed suicide. Right? But he, th that's the instruction in Acts 1, verse 2. I'm continuing the story. I told you about what Jesus began to do and teach. Now I'm going to tell you about his being taken up, the Holy Ghost being given, and the apostles and the commandments you gave them. Right? Jesus gave commandment for them to begin at Jerusalem to preach what the law and the prophets said about a kingdom come. That's what Jesus said. Acts 1 says, this is the account of that. The account of the apostles preaching a kingdom come according to the law and the prophets. How did we get here? You see, this is the issue with Acts. Acts chapter 1, verse 21. Wherefore of these men, as they're now choosing a man to replace Judas, wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us? They're trying to qualify a new, a new apostle. And it says, this is the qualification. He has to have been among us and company with us all the time that Lord Jesus went out in and out among us. Look at verse 22. Beginning from the baptism of John. So is Acts 1 a beginning? Well, it's the beginning of the book of Acts. But what they're beginning from is the baptism of John. You see that? Acts 1, this chapter here, harkens back to what Jesus said in Luke. And what Jesus said in Luke harkens back to what he said earlier on in his ministry. And it goes back to the Gospel of John, or the baptism of John, right? So Acts 1 is just a continuation of Jesus' earthly ministry, right? It's pretty clear. Look at Romans chapter 1, or Romans chapter uh, 1, verse 15. Romans, Paul says, I am ready to preach the Gospel to you that are at Rome also. In Romans chapter 1, verse 5, he says, By whom, by Jesus Christ, we have received grace and apostleship for the obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Among whom are ye also the call of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Paul says, My apostleship is to the nations, to you at Rome, to all that be at Rome, Paul says. Their apostleship was to stay in Jerusalem to preach the kingdom, Right? And then go to the world. Did that happen? Well, that's what we're going to learn in the book of Acts. Is how did we get to Rome? How did an apostle get sent to Rome? I thought the apostles were in Jerusalem. Why is an apostle in Rome? By the way, the only account we have of any apostle going to Rome is Paul, not Peter. Right? Which is fascinating for the history of Roman Catholic belief. So you have two cities, Jerusalem and Rome. We have two revelations. In Luke chapter 1, verse 70, uh, Zechariah prophesies about the salvation that is now coming through Jesus. And it says it was a salvation spoken by the prophets since the world began. That's what Jesus said. That's what John said. That's what Zechariah said in Luke chapter 1, verse 70. It's over here. 
in Acts chapter 2, verse 16, at the beginning of the book of Acts. Acts 2, verse 16. Look what Peter says. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. He's answering the question of what's going on with these people speaking in tongues. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he quotes Joel for the next three verses. All right? So Luke 1 says, as the prophet spoke, salvation is going to come through this Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, here's Peter saying, as the prophet spoke, so it's happening. All right? So it seems like a continuation of the prophets, a continuation of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts 3.21. We're moving through Acts here. Peter's preaching here again. And says, Christ is in heaven, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. What's the time of restitution? Kingdom. All right. Time of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. So Luke 1 agrees with Luke 24, which agrees with Acts chapter 2, which agrees with Acts chapter 3. They're trying to perform that which the prophets said. So far, no problem. How do we get here? Romans 16.25, Jesus says, I'm preaching Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. How do we get off that truck? How do we get on, speak what the prophet said, do what the prophet said, to I'm saying something the prophet's never said? That seems to be a departure somewhere. So, a change happened here. If all we knew was what we've read so far, we think, well, it's a continuation. There's no, no big deal. It's a fulfillment. And many Christians think that. Acts is simply the fulfillment and playing out what the prophet said. They miss verses like Romans 16, 25, where Paul says, I'm preaching a mystery kept secret since the world began. The prophets didn't speak about it. Right? Well, that tells us there must be a change. The book between, the book of Acts, is a history of the change. Yeah. It's not the history of a continuation. It's not just the continuation of Jesus' ministry through the Holy Spirit apostles. It's a change in what God is doing. Something happened. Right? Now, you all have bits and pieces of Acts in your mind. You know what happened. Right? But that, this is what the book is about, and this is what I'm trying to articulate. There are two apostles of Christ. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 11. You have Jerusalem, you got Rome. The gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Christ. Right? You have, since the, the world began, kept secret since the world began. You have Acts 1, verse 11, where Jesus' ascension, which is a doctrine often neglected, but very significant. Jesus uh, resurrected and then ascended to heaven. If he rose from the dead, why isn't he still here? He left. And that's just not, that's just not a cover-up. It's like, this is what happened. The, the apostles didn't even really know why he was leaving. Because he died, he left, he resurrected. Now that he's here, then he goes up and the apostles are going, what? Where's he gone? Acts 1, 11. While they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? He told you what to do, right? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, as you have seen him go into heaven. He went into heaven with the clouds, and he will return in his kingdom in the clouds. As you see him leave, you'll see him return, is what the angels say to him, Right? And this is typically what Christians think is the last time anybody saw Jesus. I mean, those who don't believe in the resurrection say the last time they saw him was when they put him in the tomb. Well, Christians know he rose from the dead. That's what the Bible teaches, that's what the evidences show. Yeah. Right? He rose from the dead. Acts 1 then continues that saying, well, his resurrection began in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, with 40 days of preaching to the apostles about the kingdom, which is a continued doctrine being taught. And then in verse 9, 10, 11, he ascends to heaven, and the angels say, don't worry, he'll come back in the kingdom, yeah. as you've seen him. And they proceed from that point doing the work Christ told them to do. Was that the last anyone saw Jesus? Many Christians think so. And yet, in Acts chapter 9, <laughs> in Acts chapter 9, we have in verse 5, Jesus appearing in a vision from heaven to Paul, in a blinding light and glory, which is from the Lord, and Paul says, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Jesus returns. And that is not how he left. Right? He didn't leave in blinding light. When he comes back, every eye shall see him. Yeah. Paul was blind. That's different. But still, Jesus is talking. I thought he was gone until the kingdom. Now he's back and he's talking. Isn't that important? Yeah. 
The last words of Jesus? I think not. The last time anyone saw Jesus? Not so. In 1 Corinthians 15, 8, Paul says, Last of all, he was seen of me. Something happened here that is significant. You talk about Jesus and talk about the importance of his earthly ministry. He died, rose from the dead, he ascended, and he returned. He reappeared. He spoke again. Not just through his words or through the Holy Spirit, but he himself spoke. Like, why isn't that taught? What's the last words of Jesus? Not there. Not there. Right? Something happened in this book between. Do you see the importance of Acts? You see also its ability to confuse if you don't appreciate what's happening here. Right? Well, forget Acts. It's too confusing. We can't understand it. Forget Acts. It's just a history book. And so we'll just take our Pauline epistles. We'll take our Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's confusion. If you don't understand the change. Okay? So how can I? It's so confusing, the book of Acts. That's why I'm trying to give you a basic explanation here. There are two audiences. Look at Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Acts 11, 19. In Acts 2 and 3, they were in Jerusalem, and Peter addresses the men of Israel, Jews, which was a continuation of what Jesus came to do. He says, I came not but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He says to begin at Jerusalem, which is to say to Jews. Right? He didn't say, first go to the Gentiles. Whoever's going to hear it, just go to them. He says, go to Jerusalem. They've got to be on board. Because the promise, remember, was that his seed, his nation, would be a blessing to the other nations. So that nation has to be saved first, right? And so in Acts 11, verse 19, as far as Acts 11, we have they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phinehas and Cyprus and Antioch, which is not as far as Paul traveled, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. Why? Well, we got a Messianic Jewish ministry. No, that's not what was going on. They were preaching the Messiah. They had a Jewish ministry. But that was what Christ told them to do. Like all of them. It wasn't a preference they had. None of the Jews only. Why would they exclude Gentiles? Because the Gentiles were to be blessed as a result of Israel's salvation. And as long as Israel and Jerusalem were not saved, you can't go to Rome. Question, why did Paul go to Rome? Israel was never saved. Acts explains this, right? So you have two audiences, one Jews only. In Romans 1, 13 through 16, we've already read some of that. Paul says to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. And, and people, I don't know why, I want to underline the Jew first part. Is that significant? It's like, of course it was the Jew first. He set up Abraham and Moses, and Jesus came to Israel, and he sent the Holy Ghost to Israel, Jew first, right? The important part of what Paul's saying is also the Greek. He's making no distinction. Right? You said the Jew was first. Of course they were first. Look, look. Historically, they were first. Right? And they rejected it. Right? When Paul says, I'm also going to the Gentiles, I'm also going to the Greek. Who gave you the authority, Paul? Answer, Jesus. Because he came back and spoke. Right? Acts 11, 19 says the Jews only. In Romans 1, 13 to 16, it's the Jew and Gentile. Right? How do you get from Jew only to Jew and Gentile? Did Israel get saved in the book of Acts? Did the kingdom come in the book of Acts? There are Christians who think so. There are Christians who say prophecy was fulfilled in this book. And so this is the chronicle of the fulfillment of prophecy so that now the kingdom is here. Right? Because how else do you explain this? Well, there's problems with that, right? So Acts is an important part. How you interpret what happened in Acts determines whether you're amillennial, postmillennial, premillennial. So what do those things mean? Well, that's not today's lesson, but... It's a bridge, right? And if you don't know what the bridge is doing, you're going to end up somewhere else. Fall off the bridge. So the book between. The lesson here, God is not doing the same thing throughout. God changes what he was doing, which is the lesson in dispensational charts. And that's what the lesson here is, between two things. God changes. Now, what is the change? Here's the second chart, or third chart I'm going to give you today. Acts, the story of the fall of Israel. What was the change? The change was Israel fell, right? That was the change. Salvation promised through Abraham and David's covenant and through Jesus' ministry of the kingdom was that when Israel gets saved, he comes back in that kingdom, then the nations of the world will be blessed. Salvation through Israel and Zion. Israel fell. That's what the book of Acts is about. Now the theme most people think of the book of Acts is the birthday of the church. 
Jesus came, the founder, the head, the Lord, the God. He came. He gave his two cents. He died, rose from the dead. That was important. And now it's our turn. The Holy Ghost fills us and we carry on the banner for the Lord. That's what I think Acts is. It's the birthday of the church and it's the continuation story of our great success. Now included in that is some struggles, some pitfalls, but you know, the church fought through and we succeed. Here we are today. Book of Acts. That's how it's typically thought. Jesus laid this foundation and then Acts is the Holy Ghost in us. Church, right? Is that really what happened? Is it just like Martyr's Mirror, or the Book of the Martyrs, just a story of some of the, the hardships of early Christianity, but they were zealous and they were spiritual and they got through it and here we are. Praise God for the people in the Book of Acts. You know, is that what happened? The theme is not the birthday of the church, folks. In Acts chapter 1 and 2, there was no idea of what the body of Christ was. I'm not talking about the flesh and blood body of Christ. They knew that it died and went to heaven. They just saw it go up to glory, right? I'm talking about the new creature made of Jew and Gentile. Right? The new creature, which is part of that fellowship of the mystery, Ephesians 3 talks about. This new creature of which every man who is in Christ now is a part of. That was unknown by the apostles, filled with the Holy Spirit. Not that the Spirit didn't know it, it's that he didn't tell the apostles about it. That wasn't what he was doing. The book of Acts is not the birthday of the church. Okay? It is the record of the spiritual fall and apostasy of Israel. The book is titled The Acts of the Apostles. Others have called it The Acts of the Holy Ghost, which is an appropriate type of idea, because it's the Holy Ghost being poured out and working through apostles. Right? Whether it be Peter or Paul, and all, it's the Holy Ghost works. It's the, there's a lot of miracles in the book of Acts. And miracles in the Bible always have a purpose. They're never random. The purpose is always to verify and confirm the message of the man God sends. Right? And so God sends some men, apostles, that's what apostles are, and the Holy Ghost miracles performed by them verify what they communicate. We need to know what they're communicating, right? We've already seen and we know what the apostles at Pentecost were communicating because it's the same thing Jesus communicated in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? When Paul writes Romans, this, where did he get that information? This seems like a different type of thing. He says he received it from Jesus Christ. When? Paul wasn't even saved in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Answer? In the book of Acts, right? Acts isn't about the birthday of the church, however. It's not even about Paul's apostleship. You see, we're mid-Acts. Yeah, I understand. That's, that's, it's trying to tell you in, in the place of history, right? But other than that, it's, it's, it's a horrible type of adjective because it confuses people to throw them in the book of Acts and they go, I don't know what's going on here. It puts them on a bridge and they go, I don't know what's happening. Right? What the book of Acts is about is the fall of Israel. It's Israel rejecting the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist was sent by the Holy Spirit to Israel. They cut his head off. The Son of God was sent to Israel. They crucified Him on a cross. Yeah. The Holy Ghost was sent to Israel. What did they do with the Holy Ghost? That's the account of the Acts of the Apostles. And the reason why the Acts are important is the same reason why the miracles and Acts of Jesus were important. Because they verified that He was the Son of God. The Acts of the Apostles verified they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And when they rejected them, they rejected God. Right? And so this is the story. Let's see this. In Acts 1, verse 3, look at the beginning. Say, I don't believe you. I don't believe that Acts is a negative book. I like to see through the negative and look at the positive. And, well, Acts chapter 1, in verse 3. To whom also Christ showed himself alive after his passion. The apostles. He showed himself to the apostles alive after his passion. That is his death, right? After his passion by many infallible proofs. That word infallible is an amazing word. Infallible means this cannot be corrected. It is absolutely true. People to say, I want proof and evidence that Christianity is true. Well, we don't find Christianity as Paul taught in Acts chapter 1, but we see here the term infallible proofs. And Christians today think that they take leaps of faith. Like, no, that's, that's, that's not what the Bible talks like. The Bible gives you evidences and proofs, Amen. and you just don't know to use them. Infallible proofs. Like, people saw him raised from the dead. Yeah. It's not just a doctrine. It's like a historical testimony. Like people saw him. Well, a lot of crazy people believe crazy things. Yeah, but people who thought he was dead said they saw him and were killed for it. Yeah. Like, if you were lying, even to yourself, wouldn't you say, <laughs> gigs up, I want to live another day. Right? You might. Or what about the chief persecutor in opposition to Jesus Christ? Yeah. He gets saved saying, I saw Jesus. How? You know, the prevailing theory among the skeptics is Paul had a sickness in his brain. That's the thought. 
that he had, delus he had a delu uh, disorder in his brain, uh, had delusions. That's convenient. That the guy upon which lays a foundation that reaps the church for the last 2,000 years was mentally ill. Right? There's no evidence of this. They want evidence. There's no evidence of this. That's what they say. Anyway, Acts 1, verse 3. Infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. You see that? Look at verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked Jesus. The fact that they're asking Jesus after he died is amazing. Oh, they're talking to a ghost. No, they're, they're talking to Jesus. He raised from the dead, Acts 1, verse 6. And they asked him, saying, now this is not anything you hear ever in an Easter message. They don't get this far, right? They should, though, because Luke continues the story. In Acts 1, 6, the apostles ask him, if you had any question you want to ask Jesus when he raises from the dead, what would you ask him? It probably wouldn't be this. Maybe it would. Maybe some of you more astute would be like, oh, I want to know that. Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Is that first on your mind? It's probably not. But it's a major topic in the Bible. It's a major subject of prophecy. And it's what Jesus taught in the gospel of the kingdom. It's what the apostles taught in the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom was at hand, at hand. And now that he died, they're going, is it still at hand? Now he rose from the dead. They're saying, is it, is it now? Is it going to happen now? How soon? When is it? Can you tell me the day and the hour? Right? And Jesus defers. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons, which the Father has put in his own power. The Father knows the day and the hour. The Father not only knows, but he's given it to Jesus to know as well. I'm not going there at the moment. The, the question is, the kingdom to Israel. So, the beginning, will the kingdom be restored? And what does the kingdom mean? That Israel is saved and the nations get blessed by them. Will the kingdom come? Will Israel be saved? That's the question. Jesus says it's not for you to know. Okay, don't like the answer, but this is what they're oriented towards. Right? Look at Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, preaches as much. Remember, this is not Peter preparing an outline here. This is the Holy Ghost causing him to utter words. This is God. Acts 3.19, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. We've already read verse 21. He's in heaven now, but he's going to come back for the kingdom. You better repent, because when he comes back, if you're not on board with him, then you get judged. So you want the good parts, not the bad parts of that kingdom. And Peter's preaching that in Acts 3. The orientation, the kingdom come. The orientation, Israel's salvation. Right? And so we look at Acts 20, look at Acts chapter 7. Look at Acts chapter 7, verse 51. Acts 7, 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Who is speaking here? Stephen, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking to Israel, the rulers of Israel and Jerusalem. He calls them stiff-necked. He calls them uncircumcised in heart. You don't deserve to be called a Jew. That's what he says. And ears. Do you always resist the Holy Ghost? What's the book of Acts about? A kingdom being offered to Israel, and they're rejecting it. The Holy Ghost going to Israel saying, let's do this, and Israel's rejecting it. Do you, it says, do you always resist the Holy Ghost? As your fathers did, so do ye. They did before. It's nothing new. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. You killed Jesus. Why not me? Stephen is antagonizing. Right? If you killed them, you killed the prophet, kill me too. Stephen's choosing sides. And it's against Jerusalem. Right? He wants them to be saved, but they're not hearing the message. They're resisting it. Verse 53, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. And when they, they being the leaders in Jerusalem, heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. That's not gratitude. That's not like, thank you, Stephen, for that correction and enlightenment. This is like, we're about to stone you. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up, so he saw the gnashing of the teeth, right? Stephen goes, we're not, we're not done yet. Obviously, we're not there yet. So he looks up to heaven. And he says, steadfast in heaven, and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, another evidence of his resurrection, and says, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord. We can't handle this blasphemy, is what they said. They cast him out of the city, they stoned him, 
and they didn't have a problem with it. This is the leaders of Jerusalem stoning those filled with the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 7. Right? And people want to say the book of Acts is about the coming of the kingdom. The city of which the kingdom is supposed to come just stoned the Holy Ghost filled apostles. Not looking good. I mean, when's that kingdom come? We're in Acts 7. When's it going to happen? When's it going to be where Jerusalem says in one voice, yes, we believe in Jesus Christ and he is our Messiah? It didn't happen there. In fact, did it happen anywhere? You who have read it before realize it didn't ever happen in the book of Acts, which is the whole challenge this morning. The book of Acts was a change. What kind of change? It was the fall of Israel, not the rise of Israel. Right? This change was Israel's hopeful opportunity to receive the gospel of the kingdom by the Holy Ghost filled apostles of whom it was offered, and yet they rejected it. Israel fell. Israel denied it. Okay? It turns this positive, happy book to a negative thing. Right? I might offer to you that the idea of the book of Acts is a positive success story is something you impute to the scripture. Because if you read the book of Acts, in every chapter there's some resistance by Israel. Almost every one, right? In Acts chapter 1, they have to replace a betrayer. In Acts chapter 2, okay, he's preaching a message. In Acts 3, the result of this message, chapter 4, is he gets thrown in jail, right? Peter gets thrown in jail thrice. In Acts 12, he's thrown in jail the last time. He gets, uh, he gets taken out of jail miraculously by an angel. And you don't hear much from Peter after that, right? The Jews in Acts 15 are trying to get circumcision uh, applicable to Gentiles, in Acts 16 and 17, we have Jews in other cities persecuting Paul. In 18 and 19, they're kicking Paul out of synagogues. In Acts 14, Paul is stoned himself by Jews. Like, shouldn't they be the ones who it was delivered to first to be receiving this message? Right? And so Paul's going farther and farther away of Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 19 and 20, he's performing miracles among the Gentiles. But the Jews are rejecting it. He says, I'm going back to Jerusalem. Because I have a, a hope for them. A hope for Israel, that they might be saved. He goes back to Jerusalem, and welcome party? No. They put chains on him, and throw him in prison, and try to get him killed. There's an assassination attempt. He takes him to court. His only safety is at the hands of Gentiles. He flees to Rome in order to try the case against Israel, who are persecuting him. They rejected Peter. They rejected Paul. The book of Acts is a story of Israel's rejection of the apostles of Jesus. That's what it's about. All right? And so we see the fall of Israel here. Look at Acts chapter 28. You ever wonder why Acts 28 ends the way it does? You know, Paul ministered after Acts 28. It says the Acts of the Apostles. You think it might end with the death of the Apostles or something, right? So here's the Apostles. They got the Holy Ghost. They ministered their whole life. And then they died in this way or in that way. But you don't read about Peter's death in Acts. You don't read about Paul's death in Acts. It just kind of stops without tying the loose ends up of what happened to Peter. You ever had this question? What happened to Peter? Right? Or even Paul. I mean, Paul's there ministering this message in Acts 28. And well, what happened after that? Why didn't Luke continue? Why didn't God, well, he ran out of time. I mean, that's all that happened. Why didn't God just wait until it was all over and then have him write the whole story? Isn't it strange how Acts ends? If it were just a history and a chronicle of the early church, why didn't he could tell the whole story of the apostles? Because it's not about the story of the apostles and their foundation laying for the church. It's about the story of Israel and the rejection of the kingdom. That's what it's about. In Acts 28, what is significant in this chapter is that this is where Paul declares them blind. Okay, Acts 28, verse 26. Well set spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, now he's speaking here to Jews in Rome. He has spoken to Jews in Jerusalem. He has spoken to Jews among the Gentiles. He's speaking now to Jews in Rome, very far away from Israel and Jerusalem. And to this extent, from Jerusalem to Rome, Israel's rejected it. In Acts 26, now Paul says, Isaiah wrote, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand. Seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes have they closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. He quotes Isaiah about these people saying, just as Isaiah wrote, you are blind and deaf. Right? We're studying Isaiah. What happens after Isaiah prophesies this? Their city gets destroyed. 
That's what happened in Isaiah. That's what happens after Acts 28 too. And Paul declares that you're blind and deaf. Israel being blind and deaf doesn't seem to bode well for this preaching. Right? I mean, if the kingdom is supposed to come to God's promised seed through Abraham and David and Christ, and they're all blind and deaf. It hasn't come. Acts is not the account of the fulfillment of the kingdom. It's Israel rejecting the offer of the kingdom. How do we get here? <laughs> so why are we still preaching Jesus? How is this happening? Right? Well, that's an interesting mystery, isn't it? Yeah, it is, quite literally. And so the beginning, it begins with, will the kingdom be restored? At the end of the book, the kingdom is refused. At the beginning, will Israel be saved? At the end, Israel is declared blind. The answer is no. Right? So the book actually makes sense when you realize the purpose of it. Yeah. It doesn't stop randomly in the middle of Paul's ministry. Why, doesn't, why isn't there an account of the no doubt dramatic trial with Caesar and Paul? I was waiting for that. I mean, I thought that was a denouement. You know, I mean, that's the movie right there. You go to Caesar, and here's Caesar in Rome. There's Paul walking in Rome, and there's Caesar. And then, whoo, that'd make for a movie. It doesn't even include it in Acts 28. Like, he has a side meeting with the Jews, and that's it. You're like, what happened? Because the book's about Israel and their rejection, not Caesar's acceptance of rejection. It's about Israel's acceptance of rejection. And the answer is very clear by the end. They have rejected it. The kingdom did not come. Israel was not saved. That's what Acts says. The fact that Paul goes to Rome is indicative that something has changed from what it began. What began here has changed here. You see the dispensational difference? That's what Acts is about. Acts is the history of why the kingdom did not come and salvation left Israel. Let's move on here. The book of Acts. Here's your fourth chart today can be said to be a history of the ministries of Peter and Paul generally. Peter representative of the twelve apostles, right? Being at one point the chief of those apostles it seems like. He was a spokesman in Acts 2. He preached the message in Acts 3. He was a spokesman in Acts 4 when he was caught in prison. Remember Acts 4? Alright? He, he, when he's, he's told to obey the magistrates, he said, rather obey God than you. Remember that? And Peter, bold man. That guy is bold. He's filled with the Holy Ghost and he's speaking there. You don't hear a word out of Peter after Acts 15. Where did he go? In Acts 12, when he's thrown in prison for the third time, which is interesting, number three, because Peter denied Jesus three times. Yes, he did. In the book of Acts, he's thrown in prison for speaking about Jesus three times. Right? He's delivered all three times by the Holy Ghost. But after the third time delivered by the angel there, it says, and Peter left to go another place. He, he was in hiding. Peter was in hiding. It goes from Peter, so bold to go to the temple and speak about Christ, unto arrest, to Peter being led out by an angel in the dark and going off to a hidden place because they were being persecuted. In Acts 12, they were scattered. In Acts 8, they were scattered by Saul. By Acts 12, it was just the apostles going from secret houses. He was knocking on a door, let me in, let me in. Remember they let him in, John Mark let him in? Right? Why didn't he go back to the temple and preach? Well, where did the zeal go? Where did the boldness go? Where did the Holy Ghost unction Right? Peter's ministry and Paul's ministry. Israel's rejection is what the book's about. In Acts 1 through 15, 15 is the last time you hear about Peter, he doesn't say anything after that. It records Peter's ministry to Israel, it records how Peter is rejected by Israel, and how Gentiles accepted Peter. Remember Acts 10? Peter went to a Gentile. He didn't want to, but God told him to. And a Gentile actually accepted his message. I mean, there's some ripe fruit right there. Why didn't Peter continue with that open door, as Christians like to say? He didn't, by the way. Years later in Acts 15, he says, I remember once I went to a Gentile. I mean once. In Acts 11, the next chapter after Acts 10, they went to Jews only. Why didn't they say, oh, there's right fruit, we'll forget Israel? Because Israel was significant for the gospel of the kingdom that Peter preached. So Gentiles were receiving it was a shame to Israel, but we have to get Israel on board here. It's like things are happening in a different order, right? That's why he didn't continue going to Gentiles. He was sent to Cornelius, not to all Gentiles. He was sent to all nations in Matthew 28 after Jerusalem was saved. But they had never been saved yet. And so what we get in Acts 10 is a, a devout Gentile who Peter preaches this kingdom message to about Christ. They receive it and the Holy Ghost tells Peter, these Gentiles are going to get it even though Israel's rejected you. Right? 
That's Peter's ministry to Israel. He is rejected and Gentiles accept. Now, an extra 9 where Paul gets saved here. Paul gets saved in Acts 9. Through the rest of the book, we have Paul's ministry. Now, of course, we got Peter you know, in Acts 10, in Acts 11, we have him in Acts 15. But Paul, primarily the rest of the book, he, he increases. Right? His, his ministry gets more and more and more. And I draw this line like this where Paul increases and Peter decreases because that's how you, what happens when you summarize each chapter of the book of Acts. Do it yourself. Or get the details, just summarize the chapters. You have Peter taking charge with a uh, twelfth man here. We have Peter preaching a message here. Peter preaching a message here. Peter leading the book here. Peter, Peter, Peter. Right? Peter even has to go to Samaria to lay hands on the Holy, uh, for people to get the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 8. Acts 9, Paul. It even ends with Peter, however. Acts 10, Peter. Acts 11, Peter. Acts 12, Peter. That's Easter where he gets released. Remember? Acts 13, Paul. 14, Paul. 15, Peter and Paul. 16th, the rest, Paul. So you, you summarize the chapters, and you have Paul increasing and Peter decreasing as the subject, right? as, the, as the protagonist. Paul's ministry then, in Acts 9 through 28, you say, well, good, Paul's ministry. I thought we're Paul lines. So we're going to go find our pattern in the book of Acts. No. The book of Acts is not about the pattern for the body of Christ. It's not even about the gospel of the grace of God. Paul in Acts 20, 24, the only place in your Bible the phrase, the gospel of the grace of God shows up is in Acts 20, 24. And when Paul says that to the church in Ephesus, he is not explaining the gospel as he does in Romans. He simply utters the phrase. Without the book of Romans, without Paul's epistles, you only read Acts, you don't know what Paul's saying any different than Peter. You won't know to look for it. There are differences, but you wouldn't know to look for it otherwise. Okay. There are some slight differences, some important ones, and you can, you can study those in our chapter by chapter book of Acts. We studied some 50 weeks in the book of Acts. You can get all those online. But there are very important differences, but we know to see them because of what Paul wrote about himself. The Acts, Paul didn't write this book. Luke did. Luke wrote it to explain what happened to Israel during Jesus' ministry, what happened to Israel during the, the time of the apostles. It ends with Israel's rejection of all of them. If you want to know what Paul taught, read his epistles, right? But anyway, Paul's ministry as recorded in Acts is his ministry to Israel. That's why Paul goes to synagogues more than 11 times in the book of Acts, recorded. And you don't read a single time in his epistles of him ever doing so. Why? Because him going to synagogues wasn't an important part of his ministry to the body of Christ. Why does Luke record it? Because this book's about the fall of Israel. And so we're going to express Paul's ministry as it relates to Israel. So every time he goes to a city, he went to the synagogue, and they rejected him. He went to the synagogue, and they rejected him. In fact, there's not a synagogue he ever goes into, they don't kick him out. That's the point. That's not success. Any success Paul had was outside the synagogue, which drives home the point that Israel's rejecting Christ. Right? But otherwise, Paul doesn't care that people reject him. In his epistles, he's writing to people who've, who've received the gospel, right? So you don't read about Paul complaining, I went to some synagogues over there and, uh, man, my life was ruined. You know, nope. In Acts 9, Christ sends Paul to Israel and Gentiles. Why did he send him to both? Because his message is going to be to everybody. But secondly, because his message, as we'll see here in a bit, is contingent upon Israel's rejection of Christ. Paul has to go to synagogues because without Israel's rejection of Christ, there is no mystery salvation. You understand? Let me say that again slowly. Salvation, according to the kingdom, was salvation to Gentiles through Israel's rise in salvation. Israel gets saved first, then Gentiles get saved. Mystery salvation is how Gentiles and anybody else can get saved while the kingdom's not here. And Israel's rejected Christ. That's what makes it a mystery. If Gentiles get saved by Israel's acceptance, not Israel's rejection, it's not a mystery, folks. It's not a mystery at all. So the fact that Paul's going to the synagogues here is amplifying his mystery information because every synagogue rejects it. He's going, well, you reject it. I'm going out there to those guys. Well, you can't do that. He goes, yes, I can. <laughs> right? That's what happens in the book of Acts every time. Which shows you Paul had different instructions, but it also shows you more importantly the theme that Israel's rejecting it. So at the end of the book, Israel rejected it, but there's still salvation being preached. How? According to mystery. Right? 
That's, that's how, you, how you deal with that. But Paul's ministry was to Israel. He was rejected by Israel, and Gentiles accepted him. That's the story. It was the, see how that's the same for Peter and Paul? They both go to Israel, they both are rejected, and Gentiles accept them both. Now their messages are different, right? But they're both preaching Christ, right? It's the same Christ Paul preaches in Romans as he preaches in Ephesians. Same Christ, okay? If you go to the book of Acts to try to find your Pauline pattern, you're going to be messed up. Because in the book of Acts, Paul water baptizes, he circumcises, he takes vows, he takes holy days. Why? Acts is about Israel and their fall. The reason why Paul is recorded to do those things, he's doing those things for the sake of Israel. Because he, by any means, if he can get them to hear his message of salvation, that they could be saved, he has a hope for them. If that means I go to their Pentecostal days, they don't think I'm a heathen or something, I'll do that and preach them the gospel, and they still reject him. If that means I'm going to take Timothy, okay, not a devout Jew at all, and circumcise him so that we can go to the synagogue together and they don't kick him out, I'll do that. But that circumcision didn't matter. And the fact that Timothy was circumcised means he wasn't part of Peter's group. Okay. But Peter and Paul, or Paul here, does these things for the sake of Israel. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 20, he says to the Jews that become a Jew, that I might save some. Peter was trying to save Israel, wasn't he? Yeah. By preaching a kingdom. They rejected that. They stoned Stephen. They kicked him out of Jerusalem. Paul's trying to save Elman, isn't he? Yeah, he is. By the gospel of the grace of God. Acts is the story of salvation to Israel that they rejected. That's it. That's what Acts is about. You say, why do, I, why do I care if Israel rejected it? Because that's the only way you'd be saved now, that God counts all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Right? And that's how it went, went to the Gentiles. Right? So, Peter and Paul, people have the idea of Acts as like Peter and Paul competing ministries, right? The domination of Peter, the domination of Paul, and they're fighting back and forth with each other. What a confusing time. They're not fighting back and forth with each other. They're not competing with each other. You understand? Paul didn't see Peter for years after he got the message. He articulates that in Galatians 1. But they weren't in competition. Even when he goes to Jerusalem and communicates with Peter in Acts 15, Peter gives him the right hands of fellowship. As P Paul says in Galatians 2, they didn't add anything to me. I added some things to them because obviously they needed to be updated with what Christ told him. But they didn't add anything to Paul because Paul already knew what Christ was doing. Right? And Paul says the same authority that gave them apostleship, which was Christ, was the authority that gave me apostleship, which was Christ. And so they agreed. Saying, yep, uh, we see by the account of your miracles and the account of your ministry that Christ did appear to you. Barnabas, we trust him as well. Christ did come to you with a message. So you better do that. Right? They weren't competing. Peter, however, in his ministry was diminishing. Peter was very strong on the gospel offer of the kingdom and his group to Israel here in Acts 1 through 7. When Stephen was stoned, the next chapter, Acts 8 verse 1, says they were scattered by the persecution of Saul. The ministry of the kingdom in Jerusalem was disbanded. How? You can't have a kingdom without people, right? And if the people who are going to be in the kingdom are gone, it doesn't look good for the kingdom, right? You don't count that as success. Oh, we still got hope, folks. I mean, they had hope for a kingdom, but it wasn't coming then, obviously. Right? The believers of the kingdom, the kingdom, people who were promised entrance to the kingdom, had been scattered out of the city. Right? Shall I, shall I draw the image? Here's Jerusalem. Right? They're trying to minister this kingdom come right here. In Acts 8, these believers are scattered outside it. Jerusalem is not saved. That is not the picture of the kingdom. People think, well, Ju Jerusalem, Judea, it's progressing. No, it's going away from Jerusalem, right? They were in hiding in Samaria, in Judea. Paul chased them, or Saul chased them, right? But in chapter 7, they reject this Holy Ghost-filled Stephen. They are scattered out of Jerusalem in Acts 8. In Acts 11, Peter, after he goes to Cornelius, comes back and has to defend himself to the elders in Jerusalem. Peter. Why does Peter have to defend himself in Acts chapter 11? Could it be between Acts 7 and 11 some things were going on where it just wasn't working like it used to in the Jerusalem? And so when he comes back, why are you uh, with this Gentile, Peter? Right? Um, and he has to, look, read Acts 11, the first part there. He has to explain and justify why he went there. And after he justifies that in verse 19, just to make it clear, 
They were going to them, but the Jews only. I mean, except for this one time that God told Peter to go to Gentiles. Right. In Acts 15, Peter speaks up, but he's not the one that closes that session. Paul goes to the elders in Jerusalem to talk about this issue of circumcision being taught among his, his believers. By the way, Paul, if we can use, I use the wrong color here. This is the kingdom group, right? We should use their color. They're scattered outside of Jerusalem. And here's Paul. He gets saved here and starts ministering here among the Gentiles. You have to have the, and I know this is a ridiculous map I just drew here. But you have to have in your mind the geography, okay? Jerusalem didn't receive it. They were scattered outside it. Paul gets saved outside of Israel and goes minister to Gentile countries. They're not conflicting with each other. Are there people who are in Peter's group scattered out here? Very few, but yeah, sure. Were there people in Peter's group helping Paul? Sure, but there was to Gentiles. It was somewhere else entirely. When Paul goes back to Jerusalem, he gets kicked out real quick. Right? Now he did that just to verify that, look, will you guys just be saved? We'll throw you in prison. Try to talk about Jesus. Right? That's where the book, the book ends. Peter's ministry is diminishing. After Acts 15, Peter goes, I had that account with a Gentile, and we should be saved like Paul says, which is Peter's authority, uh, giving credence to Paul. Then right after Peter, who speaks up? James. Who's, who's James? I thought the James died in Acts 12. This is another James. Who gives this guy authority? I'm Jesus' brother. Jesus' brother. You one of the 12 apostles? That's why Paul says, go to Jerusalem to those who seem to be somewhat, like whoever those guys were. Things have fallen apart in Jerusalem, yeah. right? It doesn't look good for the kingdom. And so Peter's ministry diminishes, right? Paul's ministry expands. Galatians 2 talks about that. I went to their Jerusalem at the end of Acts 15. Paul just takes off. Because the agreement between Peter and Paul was that Peter would confine himself to the circumcision, right? And Paul says, yep, I'll go to the heathen, the uncircumcision. What does that include? Gentiles, and after Acts 7, unbelieving Israel. Because Stephen calls unbelieving Israel uncircumcised in heart. So Peter's essentially saying, I'm confining my ministry to those that I've been ministering to. And you're going to go to Jew and Gentile who don't believe, hopefully to get them saved. Because apparently by this point, it was acknowledged that the kingdom was not coming. Israel was not going to be saved. So if Paul has a message of salvation that he can get people saved for the love of God and your brothers, go save them. Right? He's not trying to change Peter's group. There's no conflict. They say, you have out it, Paul. And Paul goes out. When Peter goes to Paul's place, which in Galatians 2 is Antioch, which Paul claims authority over, right? Paul says, not here, Peter. Right? Remember Peter starts to walk after the law and Paul says, that's not how we do it. Paul was instituting body of Christ principles in Antioch, which was outside of Jerusalem, outside of Israel, not established by Peter, right? It was a new thing. People call Antioch the headquarters or the, the home base of Paul's ministry. Eh, sort of. Right? It's where it began, around there, sort of. But Paul's real ministry happened among the Gentiles outside of Antioch. Okay? Read more details about that in our Acts series. Here's a simple Understanding the things that were here at the beginning of the book of Acts through Peter's ministry ended by the end of the book of Acts. Right? So the things at the end of the book of Acts that remain, remain. Does that make sense? The things that were there at the beginning, Peter's ministry, kingdom gospel, Pentecostal signs and wonders have stopped by the Acts 28. I'm an Acts 28er in that I believe in the chapter where things stopped, not where things started. The Acts 28 says, well, things started at Acts 28. No, nothing started at Acts 28. Things stopped at Acts 28. Right? The book stops, right? We say, well, Paul had this mystery information that, well, yeah, it continued because it was being established. And so what remained is established. The kingdom is gone. The mystery is established by this point. It's not the mystery begins at this point. It's established by this point, which is why the next book is Romans. Why does Paul write a, such a foundational letter seemingly towards the end of his ministry? Because it's now established. Ephesians is now established, right? Those letters were written to people to whom he already communicated in the book of Acts. Paul, Peter's ministry declined. Paul's ministry expanded. One more chart and we'll end it for today. Okay, This chart of salvation leaving Israel. John 4.22 says salvation is of the Jews. That's what Jesus said. That's what the covenant said. That's what the promises said. Salvation is of the Jews. 
The kingdom, salvation, comes through Israel. The question then is, where is salvation? Where is the Spirit? Look at Acts 13. In the beginning of the book of Acts, Peter is preaching coming salvation to Jerusalem. Right? They rejected it. In Acts 13, Paul is not in Jerusalem. He's in Antioch. In Acts 13, in verse 46, look what Paul says. Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. They rejected it in Jerusalem. They rejected it in Acts 13 in Antioch. So we're going to the Gentiles. Why was it necessary he go to them first? Because without Israel's rejection of it, Gentiles don't get saved according to the mystery. That's why. Acts 18, verse 6. He leaves here. He goes to Macedonia and to Athens, to Greece. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, this is in the synagogue here, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from you henceforth. I will go unto the Gentiles. Paul says to Jews in the synagogue, You reject it. I'm going to the Gentiles. He says, I will turn to the Gentiles. In Acts 13, Acts 18 says, I will go unto the Gentiles. Look at Acts 28. He's in Rome. So he's getting further and further away from Jerusalem. Antioch, Greece, Macedonia, Rome, in Acts 28. In Acts 28, 28, after he declares them blind and deaf according to Isaiah's prophecy, he says, Be it known therefore unto you, this is not Isaiah, this is Paul, that salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and they will hear it. It is sent. He's not saying, I'm going to do it in the next chapter. He says, it's, it's sent. By this point, it's gone. Israel has rejected it. The Gentiles are receiving it. Salvation is sent to them. So do you see there the question of salvation? It's of the Jews in John 4.22. Well, where is it then? In Jerusalem, ideally. They rejected it. Right? It was started to go among the Gentiles. They rejected it among the Gentiles too. It goes as far as Rome. And salvation goes to the Gentiles. So salvation is not in Israel anymore. Right? Salvation is not of the Jews anymore. John 4.22. Right? Romans 11, 11, Paul talks about their fall. It says, through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Acts is the story of their fall. Through their fall, salvation comes to the Gentiles. That's the story. Right? That's what Acts is about. And so you can divide up the book of Acts in four different quadrants or quarters, which I've done here on your outline. The first section of the book of Acts is the Holy Spirit or salvation in Jerusalem. The first seven chapters, they're in Jerusalem. But that salvation gets rejected. 8 through 15 is the story of the Holy Spirit, God, leaving Jerusalem. Okay. The first seven chapters, that salvation rejected, it ends with Israel being declared uncircumcised in Acts 7. You guys are good for nothing being Jews. Right? Because they rejected salvation of the kingdom. 8 through 15, it says, it, it tells the story of the Spirit leaving Jerusalem. Acts 8, the very next chapter, the Holy Spirit leaves Jerusalem and goes to Samaria. It's not because Jerusalem accepted it, it's because they rejected it. Right? Acts chapter 9, Saul is saved by Jesus Christ. On the road to Damascus, that's not Israel. Acts 10, Cornelius, he's a Gentile, that's not Israel. Right? Acts 12, it talks about Herod taking over. Acts chapter 12, he asked about this last Sunday a little bit. I looked into it afterward to remind myself, go and listen to our Acts studies on Acts 12. I really enjoyed studying these chapters. In Acts 12, when King Herod declares himself God, right? It was, really wasn't him that did that. He made a statement and it was the Jews who said, yes. The reason why God responded in the way he did, because Israel themselves looks at this Herod and says, yep, he's it. They receive Herod, but not Jesus. And so why is that recorded? To show the fall of Israel, right? God was leaving Jerusalem. It ends with the shutting down of the kingdom ministry. In Acts 15, you don't hear from Peter anymore. Peter was the kingdom ministry with the 12 apostles. The kingdom ministry shut down. If the God has left Jerusalem and salvation has left Jerusalem, you can't have a kingdom anymore, according to the prophets. Because this is salvation in Israel and Jerusalem. If he leaves Jerusalem, by Acts 15, it's shut down. They stumble and fall with Stephen. They reject it. He leaves Jerusalem by Acts 15. The kingdom ministry is done. Right? 16 through 21. Now is God among the Gentiles, spirit among the Gentiles. Now Paul's still going to Jews among these Gentiles saying, 
Will you believe Christ? Will you believe the gospel? And they still reject it. His ministry among the Gentiles ends, well, let me give you a brief explanation of that time period, where everywhere he goes, read the account in the book of Acts, everywhere Paul goes, he's chased by Israel. Right? He went to Thessalonica. Or he, yeah, he went to Thessalonica, chased out of town by unbelieving Jews. Went to Berea, chased out of town by unbelieving Jews. Right? Went to Corinth, chased out of town by unbelieving Jews. Why was he in Rome? He was chased there by unbelieving Jews. So even among the Gentiles, it wasn't just that Israel said, not for us, move on. They chased Paul. And Paul went out to the Gentiles, they're chasing him out there saying, kill this man. Right? Wow. So it ends with Paul being bound. Paul says, you're chasing me? I'll come to you. I'll go to Jerusalem. And Paul was warned, you go there, you're going to be captive. And he says, it's my last chance to see if they'll receive salvation. He goes there. He's bound. So the last seven chapters or eight chapters of the book of Acts, Acts 21 through 28, is a court trial. It's a hearing, really. It's court hearings between Paul and Israel, the apostle of Christ and Israel. And it ends with Israel being declared blind and deaf. They had a court hearing where Paul lays out his case according to the prophets. They reject it. And Paul says, you're blind and deaf. I'm not going to you anymore. Right? That's the end of the story going to Israel. So do you see the ending here? Every section, Israel's condemned uncircumcised, the kingdom ministry shut down, Paul's bound by Israel, and Israel's declared blind and deaf. These aren't positive conclusions for Israel. Right? The only positive outcome is that now the church, the body of Christ, has been declared, and even though Israel is fallen, salvation can still be communicated, praise God, through the apostle Christ rose up during the book of Acts. Not the apostles he started with. Right? And it wasn't their failure, by the way, it was the failure of Israel. So, Peter's ministry in the book of Acts is for Israel's restoration, their kingdom restored. Paul's ministry to Israel in the book of Acts was not to restore the kingdom, it was to provoke them to be saved. Romans 11, 13, he says, I'm the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my office, if by any means I might provoke them to emulation, that they might be saved. Right? That maybe they'll take, I'm a Jew, Paul says, maybe they'll follow me as Jews, blessing these Gentiles, and they'll get saved in the process. But they don't. They hinder the Gentiles' access. They hinder Paul. So Paul's ministry is provocation to get them saved, not to bring in a kingdom. Right. And so by the end of the book of Acts, salvation is preached because Israel has rejected Christ, not because they've received him. And that is the mystery of Christ. Okay, do you understand? What's the mystery of Christ? It's salvation without Israel. It's salvation without a kingdom. It's salvation without covenants being fulfilled. That's what the mystery is. And that is established by Acts 28. See, so things were done here. Paul writes his epistles, and we have them. And his epistles do, don't include this whole fall of Israel type of business. Romans 9 through 11 is the closest you get. And Paul gives his commentary on what happened. Right? But otherwise, you don't hear about him going to all these synagogues and him doing all the water baptisms and him. You don't read about it. It's not detailed. Paul is explaining the new information he was given. He wants Israel to get on board, and they can't even get on board with that. Right? So, Israel's rejection of Christ, if you, if you go back to our first point of Israel's fall in the kingdom, their rejection is what prevented the kingdom from coming, right? It's also what established the mystery. That's the book of Acts. At the end of the book, Israel's gone, the mystery's here. That explains how we got from this to that. Right? Is that helpful? Longer than you wanted, maybe? But hope that was piqued your interest. We went through 50, 50 lessons in the book of Acts to study through, especially this section here which I thought was an amazing study. Go back and study it yourself. Any comments or questions?